Welcome to Photos and Travel, a show that introduces you to fascinating places around the world. Please welcome our host and tour guide, Jonathan Van Bilsen. Hello and welcome to this episode. Today we're going south of the equator all the way to the eastern side of Australia, affectionately referred to as the land down under. We'll explore Sydney and Canberra, as well as visit the Great Barrier Reef and climb Ayers Rock. Depending on where you live, getting to Australia can be quite a challenge, but often the journey is part of the adventure. Our quest will begin right after these messages. It's about your brand, and at PP Print, we can help create promotional products and apparel that will put you above your competition. PP Print, more than just print. Not all Canadians have the time nor desire to manage their finances, and often that responsibility is up to financial professionals. Our goal is to help Canadian families achieve a happy and successful financial future. Visit us, the McClellan Financial Group of Asante Capital Management. Welcome back. As I mentioned, today we're going to explore the eastern half of Australia, which is certainly one of my favorite places on the planet. I had the pleasure of climbing Oluro, also known as Ayers Rock, and I spent some time in Sydney. Depending on your routing, most people from North America have the option to fly through Fiji, which makes for a fantastic layover. Fiji is a country in the South Pacific in an archipelago of more than 300 islands and is known for rugged landscapes, palm-lined beaches, and coral reefs with clear lagoons. The capital, Suva, is a port city with British colonial architecture and a population of 100,000, roughly 10% of the entire country. I continued my journey to Sydney and the island continent of Australia. In 1788, Botany Bay was established as a convict settlement. The sandy soil and poor water supplies would not support the community, so it was relocated 15 kilometers or 10 miles north to what is now known as Sydney, the largest city in Australia. Two of Sydney's most recognizable sites are the famous Sydney Harbour Bridge and the Opera House, both of which can be seen from many places throughout the city. The famous Opera House, located on Circular Quay, was a result of a worldwide competition in the 1950s and was won by Danish architect Jorn Utzen. The design symbolizes the city's love affair with sailing. Fierce political battles resulted in the forced resignation of the architect and the completion of the music center was recommissioned by the city. Finally, in 1973, after 20 years of struggle, the building was completed. Disappointed with his treatment, Utzen never returned to see his masterpiece. Despite its name, the building is really a center for the performing arts, with a concert hall, a music room, and opera, drama, and movie theaters. The Sydney Harbour Bridge spans Sydney Harbour from the Central Business District to the North Shore. The view of the bridge, the harbour and the nearby Sydney Opera House is widely regarded as an iconic image of Sydney and of Australia itself. The bridge, nicknamed the Coat Hanger because of its arch-shaped design, carries rail, vehicular, bicycle and pedestrian traffic. The bridge opened in 1932 and was a rough copy of Hellgate Bridge in New York City. It is the eighth longest spanning arch bridge in the world and the tallest steel arch bridge, measuring 134 meters or 440 feet from top to the water level. It was also the world's widest long span bridge until the construction of the new Portman Bridge in Vancouver was completed in 2012. The Sydney Harbour Ferry offers breathtaking views of Sydney Harbour, which stretches 20 kilometres or 12 miles inland from a rugged narrow entrance. The bright blue harbour is made up of wooded headlands, separating numerous bays and coves. Beside one of these coves rises the modern skyline of Sydney's business district.
Sydney's population received a real boost in 1851 when gold was discovered in the area. The expansion of agriculture and industry and the construction of new roads and railroads caused this area to lead the way in the country's push for independence in the late 1880s. The ship in the distance is a replica of the famous HMS Bounty, known primarily for the mutinous actions of its crew led by Christian Fletcher. The original Bounty sailed the waters of the South Pacific for many years. My next stop is Bondi Beach, Australia's most famous beach. Its fame comes not only from being a topless bathing area, but also because its semicircular shape has frequently been described as a perfect beach. The old mint building was constructed in 1817 as a convict dormitory. It is located next to beautiful St. James Church, complete with graceful spires. St. James was originally intended as a courthouse until the newly arrived commissioner insisted on its conversion to a church. A steeple was added to the eastern end. With a population of five and a half million, Sydney is Australia's largest and most cosmopolitan city. Greater City takes up 2,500 square kilometers, making it one of the largest metropolitan areas in the world. A short walk to the east of Circular Quay is an area known as the Rocks. It's a rocky ridge where most of Sydney was originally built. In the late 1960s, the historic area was saved from demolition, and since then these 19th century buildings have been faithfully restored into one of the city's most charming tourist attractions. Everything is within easy walking distance, and the Rocks is a great place to meet friends. 45 minutes north of Sydney, I had an opportunity to visit a wildlife park and I was greeted by a very hungry koala. These cute little marsupials tend to spend 16 hours per day sleeping mostly due to their intoxicating diet of eucalyptus leaves. The koalas have very sharp claws and when fear strikes them, they painfully hug anything they can. It's for that reason, as well as protection for the animals, that visitors can no longer hold the cute little koalas in their arms. The kookaburra bird is native to Australia and eats small bugs found in trees. I also had an opportunity to get acquainted with Australia's most well-known animal, the kangaroo. Kangaroos carry their young, or joeys as they're known, in a pouch from which the babies feed. A mother can carry two joeys in her pouch at one time for a total of two years. Although the young jump in and out of the pouch, it is always considered a safe haven from dangers that lurk outside, such as this, the Tasmanian Devil. The government has authorized licensed culling of kangaroos as their numbers have greatly increased and are now a threat to vegetation and traffic. Albino kangaroos are a rarity and seeing one was certainly an unexpected treat. Here we see a wombat, another native Australian animal. Wombats are short-legged muscular marsupials and are about one meter or 40 inches in length. And of course, sheep are found everywhere in this country, including this wildlife park. There are more than 100 million sheep currently in Australia, as sheep farming is a major industry. We'll see fairy penguins later as we explore the Melbourne area. However, they can be seen in most places in Australia near the ocean. There was also an exhibit of fairy penguins in this wildlife park. Crocodiles tend to live in the many swampy areas and one must always be careful when trekking through the bush. I left beautiful Sydney and traveled to Australia's capital city of Canberra, located about three hours south. En route, I stopped at the small town of Barima, which is best known for having the oldest pub in the country. The village is a tourist spot complete with its quaint general store and many interesting shops.
Edinburgh received its name from an Aboriginal word for meeting place. The city was developed by Walter Burley Griffin, and its geometrical design can best be appreciated from atop one of the three hilltop lookouts which surround the city. One of the most prominent features of Griffin's design is now the site of the Parliamentary Triangle, with the new Parliament House as its apex. It stretches across Lake Burley Griffin. Opened by Queen Elizabeth II in 1988, the unusual building was designed to fit the natural shape of Capitol Hill. The cost of the entire concept was $8 billion, and it took eight and a half years to complete. Most of the hill was carted away and stored. Then, after the new parliament was constructed, the dirt was replaced, giving it a bunker-like appearance. It's the only place in the world where the people can walk on top of their politicians. Here we see the original Parliament House, which was built in 1927. Nearby is the National Gallery, the home of the country's art collection, and well worth the visit. A large collection of Australian artifacts are featured, along with works by Picasso, Pollock, and Warhol. My next visit was the Australian War Memorial. Australia has participated in nine wars since colonial troops were first sent to New Zealand in 1850 to put down the Maori Wars. Australians have given their lives in faraway places such as the Sudan, the Boer War and South Vietnam. The memorial was opened in 1941 and is now the home of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. For me, the most moving section is the Hall of Memory listing every one of Australia's war dead. I stopped along Commonwealth Avenue to visit some of the many embassies located in Canberra, such as the Chinese, the American, and the Canadian. This is the Governor General's mansion located near Red Hill, which is a suburb of Canberra. Similar to many Commonwealth countries, the Governor General represents the Queen. His estate comes complete with its own collection of kangaroos roaming in the wild. The area chosen for the capital had been inhabited by Indigenous Australians for up to 21,000 years. The European settlement commenced in the first half of the 19th century, as evidenced by surviving landmarks such as St. John's Anglican Church and Blundell's Cottage. Following a long dispute over whether Sydney or Melbourne should be the national capital, a compromise was reached and a new capital would be built in New South Wales, so long as it was at least 160 kilometres or 100 miles from Sydney. The capital city was founded and formally named Canberra in 1913. Australia is also known for its horses, which many people keep for pleasure riding, a favorite pastime of the locals. If you have some free time and you're looking for a scenic place to snap a few photos, the Mount Ainsley Lookout is the place for you. You can walk there, drive there, or even cycle. As you make your way, you can take in beautiful Lake Burley Griffin, and many of Canberra's national attractions, all framed by picturesque mountain ranges. The lookout gives you a chance to see how Walter Burley Griffin's vision for the city has been brought to life. It's evident from visiting Canberra that it was a planned city and everything is symmetrically and well laid out. I found Sydney to be a very cosmopolitan city, not unlike Vancouver in Canada. This is probably because of the similarities in culture, history and climate. There's so much more to discover in Australia, and after these messages, I'll head north to Queensland and the Great Barrier Reef. At Voss, your independent grocer, it's all about hometown living and shopping. Owned and operated by Port Perry's own Terry and Christine Voss, the independent grocer carries many local items to support our town and its residents. Pet Value has a fleet of services to help you and your pet live their very best lives. Visit Pet Value Port Perry for all of your pet's needs. Pet Value, your pet, your store.
Welcome back. Visiting South Australia was exciting, but I was really looking forward to the Northeast as well as the Outback. After visiting Canberra, I returned to Sydney and drove to the airport for my journey to the next destination of Cairns, located in FNQ, or Far North Queensland. Situated on Trinity Bay, the city of Cairns is set against a magnificent background of jungle-covered mountains. The streets and parks are lined with tropical plants and floras. Sugarcane fields can be found everywhere. I took a seaside tour of the small village of Karanda, passing along steep cliffs overlooking Trinity Bay. The village of Karanda is known for its native arts and crafts and many colorful shops. It was also given the reputation for bungee jumping, a sport I did not participate in. The rainforest temperatures climb to the high 30s, and the lack of ozone protection forces most people to wear hats. The Aboriginal name for this region is Japukai, a tribal word for rainforest, and it's also the language spoken by the Japukai people. Their traditions include the haunting sounds of the didgeridoo. I continued my journey on board the famous Karanda Railroad for a fantastic trip through the jungle rainforest on my way back to Cairns. I passed along many interesting trees and plants, stopping regularly to photograph the beautiful scenery in the area. From Cairns I journeyed along a picturesque route to the small coastal town of Port Douglas for an adventure on the Great Barrier Reef. The town of Port Douglas is located 75 kilometers or 45 miles north of Cairns. It was once a bustling metropolis of 12,000 people, but today only 2,000 inhabitants live there. I boarded a large catamaran for an exciting two-hour journey to the Great Barrier Reef. Traveling at speeds in excess of 80 kilometers or 50 miles an hour, the ship sails along with more than 300 passengers skimming across the waters of the South Pacific. Upon arrival at the reef, I left the boat to board a floating pontoon to enjoy a day of snorkeling and underwater viewing of the eighth wonder of the world. The Great Barrier Reef is the Earth's largest living thing and it's visible by astronauts from the moon. It stretches 2,000 kilometers or 1,200 miles along the northeastern coastline of Australia. The calmness of the water creates an excellent spawning ground for coral colonies, which forms one of the world's largest coral reefs. The reef has taken 25 million years to form, and it's very delicate to the intense tourist trade. The Great Barrier Reef is home to more than 1,500 species of fish. After a busy day of snorkeling, I welcomed a delicious meal and an opportunity to relax in the 40 degree temperatures of the tropical environment. After my Great Barrier Reef adventure, I once again boarded the catamaran for what turned out to be an extremely stormy, rocky boat ride. The next day I left Cairns and boarded another Qantas flight to my next destination, the Australian Outback and the world-famous Ayers Rock, located deep in the center of the vast Australian desert. The color of the landscape is reddish-brown, with Ayers Rock springing up some 500 meters or 300 feet in its center. I made my way to the rock for a detailed exploration. It is considered a very sacred place to the Aboriginal tribes of Australia. Ayers Rock is one of the most majestic sites in the world. It's actually the tip of a giant monolith, the world's largest, and was formed about 500 million years ago. It is now almost entirely covered by debris and sand. 
caverns within Ayers Rock are home to bats, which live within its crevices. Ayers Rock was named after Sir Henry Ayers, the premier of the new colony. Many native birds flock around the area enjoying the peacefulness of the hot afternoon sun. Walking around the base of Ayers Rock was a fascinating experience with different views at each turn. While visiting the area, I stayed at the Ayers Rock Resort, located about 20 kilometers from the site itself. A self-contained complex, the resort is one of the only links to civilization for hundreds of kilometers. In the true style of Australian adventurers, I set forth at 6 a.m. to challenge Ayers Rock in a daring three-hour climb to its peak. An area referred to as Chicken Hill is a turnback point for many tourists, astonished by the treachery of the climb. A chain link fence is of little comfort as it only exists one third of the entire trek. The area around Ayers Rock is now a national park and has been turned over to the Aboriginal people who cannot perceive why tourists crave a desire to climb this sacred place. Once I reached a level area, I was surprised that it was not flat. Instead, the surface consists of tiny crevices, some up to 4 meters or 12 feet deep. The Aboriginals have renamed the rock Uluru, its traditional name, and they're very successful in their tourist enterprise. Once I reached the top of the rock, I battled extremely strong winds in an effort to sign the register. From the top of Ayers Rock, one can see for miles and the flatness of the area is very noticeable. I challenged the downward climb and was surprised at how difficult it actually was. Climbing of Ayers Rock, or Uluru, has been banned since the fall of 2019. This was largely due to the religious significance of the monolith, but also because of the strong winds, which would take as many as 20 lives each year. After having successfully braved the treachery of Ayers Rock, I must concur with the decision to close it to climbers. Sunset at Ayers Rock is an experience not to be missed. After leaving Ayers Rock, I passed Mount Connor, another giant monolith, en route to my next destination, the town of Alice Springs. Located about an hour's drive to the west of Ayers Rock are the Olgas. A fascinating rock formation, the Olgas are actually 36 individual stones rising from the flat desert floor. This interesting rock cluster was named for the Queen of Spain and is 22 kilometers or 15 miles in circumference. At its highest peak, it's almost twice as high as Ayers Rock. The 235 kilometer or 150 mile Lassiter Highway is the main road in the area and is traveled regularly. Stations or ranches border the highway and are home to cattle and ranchers alike. An average station can consist of thousands of acres of land and is usually left unattended by its owners. Alice, as it's known by the locals, lies just south of the Tropic of Capricorn in Australia's Northern Territory. Gusts of wind make this desert come to life as dust clouds swirl across the flat plains of the Simpson Desert. Lunch stops such as this one are few and far between. Because of its tropical location, there are only two seasons in the Northern Territory, wet and dry. I passed hundreds of birds nesting in trees as I joined a bush barbecue where I was shown the art of bread making and given an opportunity to toss a boomerang, which did not come back. The old telegraph station has been fully restored and is a fine example of early sandstone construction. 
Charles Todd, the first superintendent of telegraphs and for whose wife the town of Alice was named, began building the station in the 1870s. When the railroad came in 1929 and camel caravans became extinct, the role of this telegraph station became less important and in 1932 it was officially closed. Half of the 25,000 people in Alice Springs are Aboriginals and there is little public socializing between the two races. The temperature of Alice Springs reached a hot 40 degrees while I was there. The Aboriginal population tends to stay near Alice and they can be seen as having a walkabout regularly. It is against their religious belief to be photographed, believing they cannot pass into the next life if part of them is still in this one. The Flying Doctor base for the Northern Territory is located in Alice Springs. Fully equipped with the latest in medical technology, airplanes fly from one end of the country to the other, tending to the medical needs of small remote communities. Located just outside Alice Springs is the Frontier Camel Farm, where one has a daring opportunity to ride an Australian camel. Camels were brought to Australia by the early settlers because of their great ability to function effectively in the desert. Today, more than 350,000 camels roam wild throughout northern and western Australia. After my fill of camel riding, I ventured to the airport to continue my journey to my final destination in eastern Australia, the wonderful city of Melbourne. Melbourne has a population of just under 3 million, making it Australia's second largest city. Although it lacks the charm of Sydney's Harbour District, it does have the Yarra River running through its centre. From Melbourne, I travel south along the coast of beautiful Phillip Island and the home of the fairy penguins. As the sun began to set, I witnessed hundreds of these cute little birds marching home from a hard day's work of fishing and food gathering. Sadly, that ends my adventure in Eastern Australia. It's an extremely enjoyable destination to visit. With so many sites to explore, you may want to stay forever. For photos and travel, I'm Jonathan Van Bilsen. It's been my pleasure to be your tour guide today, and I look forward to our next adventure. If you enjoyed this program, please click the subscribe button and you'll never miss an episode. Want to know what's happening in Skugog? News and lifestyle, changes in business, and all the entertainment information you'll ever need. Plus, each edition has a new photos and travel article. Look for your next copy in your mailbox. At the standardnewspaper.ca, we try to spread the good news. Even in tough times, we accept the challenge of keeping you informed. So from local contests to local happenings, let's show our support for all those who keep our communities strong.